The road to the White House runs through the 700 Club. We sit down with presidential hopeful Tim Pawlenty for the interview you won't see anywhere else. And then... Once again, there was no heartbeat. Why one couple never lost hope on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. The response from the audience has been tremendous as we've been showing stories of supernatural visitations, angels coming, uh, people being delivered, dramatic healings, all kinds of things happening. Well, we've got more today that you don't want to miss. They're very exciting as people want to say, is there another world? Is there a supernatural world that we can be in touch with? And the answer is absolutely. And we're going to show you the biblical answers to all that. Plus, on this program, I had the pleasure of sitting down with one of the candidates for president, Tim Pawlenty, the two-term former governor of Minnesota. Real nice guy, and uh, you'll be meeting him uh, shortly. That's exciting. Well, as Pat mentioned, we're going to continue our special series on the secrets of the supernatural. Ahead, you're going to see the story of a woman rescued by an angel five stories tall. Wow, five <laughs> stories? Hey, that's a big one. That's a big one. All right. But first, citing military success and an ailing economy, President Obama is starting to pull troops from Afghanistan. But the moon could come at a price. White House correspondent Jeff, Jennifer, Wish, excuse me, Jennifer Wishon reports on the president's war dilemma. Nearly a decade after the war began, President Obama says Americans can take comfort knowing it is winding down. We're starting this drawdown from position of strength. Al-Qaeda is under more pressure than at any time since 9-11. Troops start leaving Afghanistan next month. By the end of the year, 10,000 will be home. Next summer, 23,000 more will join them. That will leave nearly 70,000 in the war zone, and the president says they will also exit at a steady pace. For the president, it's a critical time. He's seeking re-election. Lawmakers from both parties want U.S. troops brought home, and public support is sinking fast. A recent Associated Press poll shows 80 percent of Americans approve withdrawing combat troops and ending U.S. combat operations by 2014. If the Afghans don't do the fighting, well, then it shouldn't be done. I mean, we, we cannot be there fighting for the Afghans. A 30-year veteran of the CIA, Munoz says the U.S. should focus on training the Afghan army, specifically special forces to work with local tribal defense forces. The bottom line is we're leaving. And, and who's staying? The tribes. That is Afghanistan. So either you work with what is there or you don't. But other experts, including military leaders, argue combat operations need more time. So really this is not time to take our foot off the gas. This is time to push our advantage, take advantage of the, the gains that we have seen, both in terms of bin Laden's killing as well as the gains on the battlefield in southern Afghanistan we've seen over the last 10 months. But the president is weighing other factors, a ballooning deficit, deepening debt, and Americans asking how the government can spend billions on a war overseas while so many citizens are suffering at home. Over the last decade, we have spent a trillion dollars on war at a time of rising debt and hard economic times. Now we must invest in America's greatest resource, our people. Curtis argues there's more at stake than just the current military operation. If we draw back too quickly and we leave ourselves in a vulnerable position and, you know, God forbid, are even uh, struck by terrorists again, then we'll be worse off economically and it will be even more costly. Since the war began, at least 1,522 members of the U.S. military have died in Afghanistan. Today, the president visits Fort Drum, New York, a post home to the 10th Mountain Division, which has served multiple tours in Afghanistan. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, the White House. Thanks, Jennifer. It is clearly a dilemma. But the truth is, uh, it's like you've got a football game going and you've driven the ball down to the 20-yard line and all of a sudden you say, hey, time out, we're going off the field and we'll leave the game to you. 
Well, the Taliban, he said, Al-Qaeda has been weakened. It isn't Al-Qaeda is the problem. It's the Taliban and the treatment of women and their, their uh, extreme Wahhabi uh, beliefs. I mean, they're evil folks. And uh, they will not only take over Afghanistan, they're then going to take over Pakistan. And Pakistan just happens, in case you hadn't seen it, a number of nuclear missiles. And uh, it was the Khan network, you know, that was giving secrets to North Korea. I mean, the, the, we're talking about serious business here. You know, I hate being in Afghanistan, but once we're in the dumb thing, we need to get win. In war, there's no substitute for victory. You do not play at war. So the, the troops, the, the generals are saying, we need the troops to stay and finish the job. We've done it in Helmand Province. We've done it in Kandahar. Now up in the north, we've got to do something more, um, and then we can win. But. It's an ungovernable thing. Karzai is hopelessly corrupt. Uh, the warlords want their share of the booty. They don't care about um, the long-range future of this nation. They want to know their own little tribal uh, uh, fiefdom. So uh, it's a problem. And the one thing that we have never done, we should have stopped the opium traffic. It is the biggest supplier of heroin in the world. And it's being done under our auspices. They're growing poppies and cultivating this stuff while we are in charge. And that is a crime. Wendy Griffith has the rest of our top stories from the CBN newsroom. Wendy. Thank you, Pat. The Federal Reserve says the economy is growing slower than first thought. The Fed now says the economy could grow up to 2.9 percent this year. That's down from its previous top estimate of 3.3 percent. Fed Chair Chairman Ben Bernanke says some of the problems plaguing the economy may be stronger and more persistent than we thought. That comes as the Congressional Budget Office is sounding the alarm on the national debt. The CBO says America's exploding debt problem could spark a sudden fiscal crisis like the European crisis. The group is urging Congress to forcefully cut the budget. Do you think that'll be enough, Pat? Uh, not what they're thinking of doing. They're just temporizing with it. And Bernanke is saying, well, don't cut too fast because it'll hurt the economy. And yet, <clears throat> if we don't cut, we're ruining our, our uh, national uh, debt. The trouble is, ladies and gentlemen, 40 cents of every dollar the government spends is borrowed. 40 cents is borrowed. Think about running your household. Um, so you've got $10,000 a year, and uh, you're going to borrow 4000 uh, to... Uh, uh, live on every every year. I mean, you, you can't sustain it. And we're, we, we can't do this. We've got to get this stuff under control. And all these little private fiefdoms, they've got to be shut down. People have got to be laid off. There, there, there are probably hundreds of thousands of workers that are redundant. We need to stop that. And it takes a, a bold move to get us back on track. But if we don't do it, you know, two or three years, it's going to be something that none of us want to see. Wendy? Pat, thousands evacuating their homes in the face of massive floods across the Midwest today. Heavy rains and melting snow are to blame. The Army Corps of Engineers was forced to release record amounts of water from six Midwest dams to relieve pressure. Canadian reservoirs had to do the same. Now, all of that water is surging downstream. Minot, North Dakota is facing its worst flooding in decades. And further south, the Missouri River is overflowing its banks and threatening the Cooper nuclear power plant in Nebraska. Well, Al Gore wants people to have fewer children to save the planet. At the Games for Change Festival in New York this week, he connected the global population to pollution. Gore believes carbon dioxide emissions from human activities are the cause of global warming. He cites the wildfires in Arizona and the flooding along the Mississippi, saying humans need to take action to stop these kinds of disasters. His solution to, quote, stabilize the population. Gore called for ubiquitous availability of fertility management, and he said smaller families can be achieved if we can educate girls and empower women. Pat, what do you think uh, God would have to say about this? Well, I don't know if God and Al Gore are synonymous. <laughs> so hard to say. But, you know, Al Gore is a good guy. I like Al. He's a friend of mine. And uh, he gets a lot of ribbing for some of the stuff that he, he says that uh, uh, are probably ill-founded. And what he's basically saying is we, we've got too many people on the, on the globe, and we do need to have family planning. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. But 
widespread abortion is not the answer, and the one-child policy of China isn't the answer. So, you know, what do you do? Well, some people are saying, well, we can solve the problem. We could be the leader of this nation and lead it into a better future. And uh, so we have a number of candidates, especially in the Republican Party, who are running for uh, the nomination. And Tim Pawlenty served two terms as governor of Minnesota. He was known as a cost-cutter conservative in the liberal state. And now he wants to bring his brand of conservatism to Washington. Yesterday, I spoke with the GOP candidate about why he wants to be president. But before we watch that interview, here's David Brody with a look at the challenge Pawlenty is facing. Tim Pawlenty is busy pounding the pavement. His most frequent stops, Iowa, New Hampshire, or South Carolina, the first three primary states. He needs name recognition, so the former Minnesota governor is working hard to introduce himself to voters and move upward in the polls. In order to move out of the single digits, Pawlenty is positioning himself as the one candidate who will not only talk the conservative talk, but walk the walk. As we go forward, if you look at this country, we're not going to have people who are just talking about these things. We have to have leaders who can actually do them and have done them. We did tort reform and welfare reform and so much else, not just talking about it, but getting it done. Well, please welcome to the 700 Club, former Minnesota Governor Tim Pawlenty. He is now a presidential hopeful and governor. I'm delighted to have you with me. I'm Thank honored you. to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Why do you want to be president? Well, I think I've got the skills and the ability and the results to lead this country to a better place. Yeah. And I love America, and we need to do it. It's in, in trouble. What do you want to do? If you were president and, and the, the day after you were inaugurated, you, would you have three things that you'd say, oh, these are my... my first goals? I sure would. Right, number, number one, we got to get this economy going because the pathway forward for opportunity for most of our fellow citizens is to have access to a job or an economic opportunity. So sure. we announced a big economic plan. Two, I'd repeal Obamacare and ask the Congress to do that. I think that's one of the worst pieces of legislation Hopefully. in the modern history of the country. Yeah. And three, I think we, we would make some decisions in the area of security and international affairs that send the strong message that we don't equivocate, equivocate and delay when it comes to our friends around the world like Israel. And I'd reestablish and reassure that relationship. Uh, wh wh what kind of tone would you set as a president? Well, I always tell folks, especially when I would go into places like rural Minnesota when I was governor, yeah. you know, you can't be pro-jobs and anti-business. That's like being pro-egg and anti-chicken. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't work so well. Sure. And so we need to understand and remember where these jobs come from. They come from people wanting to start and grow businesses. And so this isn't about whether some small group of the country is more wealthy. It's about are we doing those things to make mm. it more likely that jobs will grow? Because that's how most people pay their bills, put gas in their car, get their sure. groceries, pay their mortgage, pay for college. And we need to be a pro-jobs country. And right now, most of the entrepreneurs I talk to are saying it's too discouraging, it's too expensive, the government's making it too slow, too heavy, too difficult, and they want the load to be lighter, not heavier. How are we going to get this deficit under control? It's a $1.6 trillion deficit. What are we going to do? Well, when I was the governor of a very liberal place, I love my state. It's a beautiful state. I know you've been there, sure. but it's quite liberal. I mean, the land of uh, Mondale and Humphrey and McCarthy and Wellstone, and now we have uh, U.S. Senator Al Franken, and I was the first, you know, movement conservative. To it's, it's a crazy state. They've got a pro wrestler as a, as a former governor and a professional comedian as a senator. I mean, what is it with Minnesota? <laughs> well, we were able to make big change there What'd as a conservative, but uh, we on taxes and spending and public employee pensions and school reform and much more. One of the leadership lessons I learned is there come a time where you have to draw a line in the sand. And this is one of the moments for the country. So this debt ceiling vote is mm -hmm. really a line in the sand moment. And I strongly hope and believe and pray that our Republican and congressional leaders uh, don't raise the debt ceiling. And if they do, please make structural, mm -hmm. permanent, big change like a balanced budget constitutional amendment, caps on spending that are real and specific. I enjoyed your book, Courage to Stand, Tim Pawlenty. You came out of... Um sort of a working class background. You didn't come with a silver spoon in your mouth. What, what was your father doing? What was his job? Well, for much of his life, he was a truck driver. But later in life, he uh, got promoted to be a dispatcher. Mm -hmm. We thought, as a family, we had hit the jackpot. But, uh, <laughs> and then a little later, he even got promoted to terminal manager. We were very proud of that. But I think yeah. my first paycheck out of law school was bigger than his last one, which was kind of a dramatic moment for us as we compared yeah. those. 
paychecks. He was a good man, and he well, learned. Did he inspire you to get educated? That you had to go to college and that sort of thing? He did, but my mom really was a driving force there. She died when I was 16 of ovarian cancer. Yeah. Uh, the youngest of five kids, and just a short time before she passed on, she summoned my brothers and sisters to her bedside, and mm -hmm. she made them look her in the eye and and promise her that they would do everything they could to get me to college. They couldn't go, not because they lacked the capacity, they just didn't have the opportunity. So my mom's uh, well, you the baby. dying wish was to get, get me to college. Yes, I was. You were the baby. I was and, the baby, and, and so yes. all, those, all those children are going to get together to get you to college. And they did. And, and they did. And they did. And it, my mom was a, a very, very wonderful woman and a great leader for our family. But that was one of her life dreams, is to have one of her kids get to college. Will you tell about your very lovely wife? Apparently, she, she is a lawyer like you. Well, she was. Now we're both have moved yeah, on to other yeah, things. Yeah, but she, thing. yeah, she. We met in law school, and she was on the board of Bethel College and Seminary in St. Paul, and and she's been involved in a lot of great ministry work, like on the board of Teen mm -hmm. Challenge and some other things. But she really was instrumental in transforming my faith life, and and uh, opened up uh, that in ways that were just profoundly important for me, and still does to this day. Well, your faith has played a big role in your life, hasn't it? It sure has. You know, I was raised uh, Catholic, and Mary and I met. She came from a Baptist tradition, so as we were getting married and getting serious about that, we I wanted to reconcile our faith lives, and she did too. Yeah. So I started attending her church. But you know, she led me to the Lord, and and, and was a powerful, uh, really leader and mentor in that journey for me. And I think if you met her, you'd yeah. be uh, impressed. She's joyful. She, she believes what we believe. And she's a tremendous a voice for the Lord, got a wonderful heart, and I, as a big part of this effort. What does she think? I mean, running for president is a, is a terrible burden on her family. Is she 100% with you on it? She sure is. is she? You know, we have two teenage daughters. Uh, uh -huh. One is 18, one is 14. You know, and they, one of them drives, and they both like boys. And so they need supervision. Mm -hmm. So Mary can't always be with me on the road. But she she's comes in when she can. Uh, and she strongly believes that this is important for the country and has the mm. same values that we do. You practice law. You were a Commonwealth or a prosecuting attorney. Then you were uh, a majority leader in the, of the, uh, I, what is it, the House of Delegates? In, House in of Representatives. House of yeah. in, in Minnesota. And then uh, did it look like you were going to win for uh, governorship? It looked <laughs> like it was, the odds were stacked against you. No, it didn't look like I was going to win. It's blue state, and I wasn't very well known, didn't have much money, and people mm -hmm. were not giving me a very good uh, chance at running. And when I first uh, started running, uh, I did this little tour around the state in a two-seater plane, and not many people showed up. It was a little discouraging on day one. Mm -hmm. And I came home and uh, went out to coach soccer that night. My daughters were playing soccer, and so I took off my suit and put on my coach's shirt and walked out onto the field, and these little girls came running up to me, and they said, you know, are you running for governor? Are you running for governor? Yeah. I thought, wow, this campaigning really works. I've only been out a day, <laughs> and it's already permeated yeah. the minds of these seven-year-old girls. Yeah. And I kind of pridefully puffed up, and I said, yeah, I'm running for governor. And then this one little girl looked up to me, and she said, cool. Do you think you could get me Jesse Ventura's autograph? We <laughs> <laughs> well, also played. You, you love hockey. You still play hockey? I do, although I'm you know post fifty now, so I'm slow and uh, old out there. But I still like to play, and I, in, in the winters in particular, we get out. It's a great sport. It's like a, I tell people, it's like human pinball. It's yeah. fast moving and a lot of action. And well, this, do you get hurt playing? I've seen people checked against the backboards. I mean, it looks like it's brutal. Well, it can be, although now in my old men's league, uh -huh. as we call it, uh, it's no checking, although people fall down and hurt themselves. So, but they can't uh, check. Not intentionally. People accidentally okay. bump into each other. So we're, we're beyond that age where you can go out and uh, lay, lay into each other. Well, Governor, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is called Courage to Stand. Is that available in bookstores? Can people buy it if they want to get it? It is. Yes, it is. Courage to Stand. Tim Pawlenty, two-term governor of Minnesota and candidate for the Republican nomination for the presidency of the United States. We'll be back with more after this. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, sir. That was fantastic. Coming up. I lost control of my car. <laughs> A near-fatal car crash. I remember my car teetering over the edge of the bridge. And a miraculous rescue. It was like these hands almost swooped down like this and took my car. Saved by an angel on today's 700 Club. It was about five stories tall, massive, wide in stature. 
you're single, you're Christian, and you're looking for a meaningful relationship, find God's match for you at ChristianMingle.com. Sometimes we wait for God to make the next move. When God is saying, it's your time to act, the next move is yours. Join free now at ChristianMingle.com. Obamacare is not only going to ruin our health care system, but it's going to put us so far in debt we will never recover. Perhaps worst of all, it was concocted in an undemocratic process. In locked rooms in the middle of the night, Obamacare was passed and rammed down the throats of the American people. In January, after we delivered petitions to the House, they voted to repeal. Now the Senate is only four votes short of repeal as well. It's critical that you call today and add your voice to the new U.S. Senate petition. Even if you've signed a petition or made a call, do it again and ask your friends to do it again. We don't want them to ever think that we're giving up so that they can give up. Call 1-800-899-5051 or go online to repealitnow.org to sign the official petition. Together, we can force Washington to repeal this costly and destructive law. Call 1-800-899-5051. Tomorrow, a live performance from recording artist C.C. Winans. Plus, a head-on collision. My feet were on fire. The car was filling up with smoke. With both drivers trapped. The steering wheel was stuck in my chest, I couldn't move. Two supernatural rescues on tomorrow's 700 Club. This has been a week for the supernatural. And all week we've been bringing you incredible stories of the supernatural. And you're about to see another amazing example. When Christine Martin went joyriding with a friend, she never dreamed how close to death she would come. Christine's car spun out of control and was teetering on the edge of a bridge. And then suddenly her life was saved by an angel. Christine Martin lived every girl's dream. The newest clothes, the coolest shoes, and money to burn. I was used to having very, very nice things, and things actually had a hold on me. It was a matter of the thing, and the home, and the nice car, and the country club, or the yachts, or the you know, driving around in, in beautiful things with your windows down so people could see you. But behind the country clubs and privileged lifestyle, Christine was living a nightmare. The molestation happened from the ages from 3 to 13. So it was happened in a very long time of my life. It was forceful and not pleasant. Yeah, it was just really embarrassing and continual, a nonstop. The abuse came from not one, but two men in her extended family. But Christine never told a soul. I was this inner kid inside screaming, wanting to tell somebody, please help me. But I was told, do not say anything. Do not tell your parents. No one is to know this is our secret. While the physical abuse eventually stopped, the emotional pain only got worse. I was very, very damaged, very hurting, very broken, lonely, uh, insignificant. I felt that no one wanted me. And just when she thought she couldn't feel any lower, she was raped at a party by a stranger when she was 16. I had this horrible, disgusting, dirty feeling relived all over again in this horrible dark stillness just captivated every part of me. I sat in the shower um, and almost made, I made myself bleed. You know, I scrubbed so hard and scratched my body and pulled my hair at its scalp. I just wanted to get every part that he had touched off me and away from me. As I told one girlfriend and she's like, oh, you better keep it quiet. You know, this is a good school and your parents and you don't want to make a, make a fuss. So I kept it quiet. Then her father lost his contracting business. She couldn't hide her pain behind a lavish lifestyle. And she used other things, drugs, alcohol, and promiscuity to mask her pain. I did not have any value for myself as a woman. Um, a body was just, you know, there's no respect for it. It's already been taken advantage of, so why does it matter to give it away? I would do drugs every single weekend, and whenever I could, almost several times during the week, I'd smoke pot, I would get high, I would skip school. But all that changed one day when she was 19. She had been joyriding with a friend. 
I lost control of my car, and my car had spun in 360s for about 50 yards. And I remember my car teetering over the edge of the bridge. I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna die with the fish. You know, I didn't think about clothes. I didn't think about people. I didn't think about family. I cried out and said, dear God, please rescue me. That's all I remember uttering. And I remember as my car was on fire, teetering over this bridge, a huge, I know it was an angelic presence, about five stories tall, massive, wide in stature, just strong and gray-like, took my car, and it was like these hands almost swooped down like this and took my car and teetered it right off the bridge onto the grass. My car door flung open, and I just remember rolling out and laying on the grass. While she was there, she thought about the angel that set her car to safety. Then she remembered going to church as a child and knew it was finally time to give her heart to Jesus. And there was this uncommon peace that I had not ever known that had come over my body and swept over my soul. And I felt for the first time in my life that I was valuable, that someone cared about this girl that I was gonna be okay. And that day radically transformed my life. And it's like I fell in love with this Jesus that everyone had talked about, but I had never known. He became so real to me on that particular day, just as real as I'm talking about him now, that I knew that all the pain and all the tragedy and everything that I had gone through, you know, maybe was not in vain because at 19, there was still a purpose for my life and I wasn't gonna be some washed up druggie you know, whisking life away and using people the rest of her life. Christine is married now and has a wonderful son, Solomon. She and her husband love to share what Christ has done in their lives. My life is amazing. I know it's because I know who I am in Christ, that Jesus has become literally my friend. He's so real to me. He is the fiber of why I do what I do, why I breathe, why I live, why I exist. It is all because God showed me grace. You know, you'd think, here this girl has been molested, she's been raped, she's taken drugs, she's promiscuous, she's thrown herself away. Why would God waste an angel on her? Because <laughs> she wasn't a waste, because she was precious in God's sight. And he sent an angel, a huge angel to deliver her and take her car and literally move it off a bridge. Think of that. A dramatic rescue to show her that she was loved. Let me tell you, how deep have you gotten in sin? Are you using coke? You smoking grass? You taking uppers? Are you snuff sniffing something? Are you out throwing your body away? Have you been hooked on pornography? What is it that's got you? You feel dirty, you feel worthless, and you feel hopeless. And God Almighty says to you right now, you are precious in my sight, and I love you. And if it takes an angel to convince you, I'll send you an angel. But I want you to know that I love you. And right now, I want you to listen to me and open your heart and let me come in. That's what he says. He's knocking at the door of your heart. And there's a nail-scarred hand that's knocking, knocking, knocking at the door of your heart. He died for you. He suffered for you. He was beaten for you. A crown of thorns was smashed into his head for you. Spear was thrust into his side for you. Are you going to keep him outside? Are you going to say, no, Jesus, I don't want you. Stay away. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think you're going to say, yes, Lord. I know you love me. How about surrendering to his love right now? I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and I'm going to ask you to just say these words silently or out loud, but mean them in your heart, and God will hear, and he will answer. Bow your head and pray with me right now. Jesus, that's right. Pray these words, Jesus. You know what I've done to myself 
you know what others have done to me. And Lord, I don't feel that I'm worthy of your love. But I know that you love me. And so I can't refuse you any longer. I respond to your love. And I open my heart to you and I ask you to come in. Take over my life, Jesus. From this moment on, I'm yours. And thank you that you're mine, that you are my Savior and you're my Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you've heard my prayer. Thank you, Lord, for coming into my heart. Now, for those of you who prayed that prayer with me, I have something I want to give you. It's free. You need to start out with something. You just made a prayer. What do you do next? Well, that's why I spent 73 minutes in an audio room doing a compact disc that tells you exactly what it means to have an exchange life, what it means to have uh, your sins forgiven, what it means to walk with God, and what it means if you commit an act of sin, what happens then? And uh, what happens when the Lord comes back again? I give this to you. It's called A New Day. Give it to you free. But I want you to call and say, I prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. It's 1-800-759-0700. And uh, if you don't want to give us your name, that's fine. But call anyhow. And if you'd like this packet, we'll give it to you. Again, no financial obligation whatsoever. Well, today is a day of the supernatural, a day of miracles. And Terry has one more that will thrill you. Boy, I do. Still ahead. A pregnancy where the baby had no heartbeat for three weeks. Not only was there absent cardiac activity, but the baby had not grown. It was all consistent with what we know to be a, a miscarriage. Meet the couple who refused to believe their doctor's report on today's 700 Club. Coming up later, a terrifying car crash. The first thought that went through my head is, where's Elise? How this four-year-old was lost. At that point, we just knew she was dead. And found. She said, well, Jesus picked me up and moved me, Mom. My name is Roger Stump, and I'm a cancer survivor. The surgeon said, it's inoperable. It's already in your liver. My wife, Brenda, sat there and cried, and I'm thinking, I can't die right now. I'm only 52 years old. I was so distraught. I've heard Cancer Treatment Centers of America had experience with pancreatic cancers. It was like night and day. The hospital just breeds an environment of hope. You'd get a CT scan, and the next morning, the results were read to you. We'd go up there. I just knew it was going to be a good result. You could just see the joy on Dr. Granick's face. Call now and we'll show you how the most compassionate people anywhere put you at the center of everything we do. Together, we'll explore real treatment options you may not even know exist. Cancer Treatment Centers of America is such a different place because they give you hope. I would strongly urge you to call them and, and get a second opinion. Please call today. Attention if you have diabetes. If you have diabetes, I have groundbreaking news for you. Citizens Medical has a way for you to test your glucose nearly pain-free. Imagine, no more pricking your fingers. With this new meter, you can test from a tiny sample taken from your arm so it's virtually painless. And listen to this. Your blood glucose reading is 103. This meter talks to you. Seeing and hearing your reading can help you confirm accuracy. Best of all, Citizens Medical can send you one at no cost. I don't test on my fingers anymore. I use my arm and I can barely feel it. And I love how this meter talks to me. You can have your diabetes supplies delivered to your home. They work with Medicare or your insurance. They handle the paperwork and have nurses certified in diabetes available to answer your questions. Call Citizens Medical today and change the way you test. Welcome to Washington for this CBN News Break. For the first time, white newborn babies are in the minority. Census figures show that um, non-white infants now make up the majority of children born in the U.S. Experts say the data confirms a changing social order. 
and that racial and ethnic minorities will make up the majority by the year 2050. Dutch politician Gert Wilders is not guilty of hate speech against Muslims. That's the verdict of a court ruling in, in the Netherlands. Prosecutors accuse Wilders of inciting hatred and religious discrimination against Muslims. He angered Muslims by saying Islam is, quote, inherently violent, and he compared the Quran to Hitler's Mein Kampf. A judge says Wilders' statements are offensive, but are still part of a legitimate political debate. One prosecutor said she plans to take the case to the U.N. Commission on Human Rights. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. What makes the miracles of Jesus even more miraculous? Standing where they happened in Israel. Come explore Jerusalem where Jesus opened blind eyes. Visit the hills of Galilee where Jesus fed the multitude. Stroll through Capernaum where Jesus lived and taught and healed. To learn more about standing where it all happened in Israel, visit www.goisrael.com. Come visit Israel. When you look in the mirror, can you imagine erasing years of aging? That's what I used to look like. Lifestyle Lift takes only about an hour. See the difference immediately. I'm Linda. I'm 70 years old. Can you believe it? Call now for a free information kit. It's quick, affordable, and takes only about an hour. Lifestyle Lift, a breakthrough medical procedure that helps remove wrinkles, frown lines, and sagging skin. Call now for a free information kit. Consultations are free. Call Lifestyle Lift today. This is the information retailers don't want you to know, especially now. They don't want you to learn just how much money you've been giving away to retail markups on items you purchase for your home. All because you don't know how to buy like the insiders do at Direct Buy Club, the home improvement and furnishings club with direct insider prices. When you go to Direct Buy, you know that things are going to be a lot less than retail and um, you don't have to worry about sales. It's just you know, one price, and it's a low price too. <laughs> I would shop around and, and, and investigate, uh, and without a shadow of a doubt, Direct Buy would have the lowest price. Members buy top quality name brand merchandise from hundreds and hundreds of trusted manufacturers. So call the number on your screen now and we'll rush you your free visitor's pass to your local Direct Buy Club and your certificate for a free 30-day membership. This is a limited offer, so call now. was comatose for four days on full life support. And then the next thing I know, I was on this hill, and there's a guy standing there in a white robe. All I could see was the feet, the sandals, the holes in the feet. And I reached up and I grabbed the robe with both my hands, begging him, please don't take me now. <laughs> please don't take me now. Secrets of the Supernatural. Well, all week we've been running poll questions on our website. Yesterday's question was, have you ever had a supernatural vision? Well, 66.3% of you said yes, 17.13% said no, and 16.57% said no, but I've had supernatural dreams. Well, we have another poll question for you today. Today's question is, does God still work miracles today? Let us know what you think by logging on to CBN.com. We'd like to hear from you. Well, speaking of miracles today, you're about to meet a couple who believes in miracles. Candace and Dennis Gaines wanted a full house, so they were thrilled when Candace became pregnant with their third child until doctors told them that their baby's heart had stopped beating. I found out I was pregnant at maybe six weeks or so. Um, then maybe about at my two-month mark, I started cramping and experiencing spotting, and um, by the end of the day, it had progressively worsened. The ultrasound showed that uh, you could see the fetus, but uh, there was no cardiac activity, and so I sent her over to the hospital where they also did an ultrasound and again came up with the same diagnosis of a fetal demise. So we began praying that weekend, and uh, we were very confident, you know, that when we went back in Monday morning that we would have good news but they didn't hear the report they hoped for. And once again, there was no heartbeat. 
the same situation. There was no fetal cardiac activity. And uh, Candace and her husband were both adamant that they felt that this pregnancy was going to continue. The doctor reluctantly agreed to give them more time. After two weeks, they went for a third ultrasound. Things had gotten worse. And not only was there absent cardiac activity, but the baby had not grown. The growth of the baby had, you know, there was, it was, she was lagging two weeks behind, where the growth it should have been at, at you know, at seven weeks, she was only measuring five weeks. So there was, there was, it, it was all consistent with what we know to be a, a miscarriage. This is the latest technology, you know, and just seeing the monitor where the heart should have been beating, there was nothing there. This time it actually showed us where a blood clot or sac had begun forming underneath the fetus. In the face of impossible odds, Dennis and Candace refused to give up. My concerns were, and, and this happens, is when a uh, pregnancy fails and it's, and it's not doing well, eventually it can become, there can be infections or heavy bleeding and hemorrhage and all these other uh, complications from not going after uh, and taking care of this. Time had run out and the baby had to be removed. The day the Gaines met with their doctor, Dennis had one last request. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Candace and Dennis Gaines. It's great to have you both with us. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay, Dennis, what was that one last request? I refuse to accept that uh, this baby would not be born. I had a covenant with God, just like Hannah did in 1 Samuel, and uh, there had to be some event that would change the course of everything that we had seen so far. And I just wasn't ready to accept what the doctors had to say. So how did your doctor respond to you? He obliged us. Uh, he, at this point, kind of wanted to move on with the medical procedure. And uh, we weren't ready. And we kind of dragged it out a few weeks. And, uh, and when I asked him if we could once more check to see if there was a heartbeat, he, uh, he pulled the equipment out and we, and we did as we had done weeks before. And uh, miraculously, this time, there was a heartbeat. What was that like, Candace? Amazing, amazing. Um, this was our third attempt at trying to conceive a child. Uh, I was over 40 years old at the time, and um, we were further along in our pregnancy than we had been with the previous miscarriages. So when the um, initial symptoms of a miscarriage um, began um, showing up, mm -hmm. we went to the emergency room immediately, and that's when we received the initial report that um, my body was preparing for once again another miscarriage. So tell me about that moment where you're on the table, your husband has said one last time, just let us have one last ultrasound to check this out. What happened? Um, I'll never forget, Dr. Terry Berry almost popped out of his seat, and he kept telling me, look, there is a heartbeat, uh, 141 uh, beats per second, and all I could say was, thank you, Jesus. It was just total shock. Was it almost hard to grasp it after what you'd been told over and over and over again over the past couple of weeks, and now suddenly, here's the reality of what you'd been praying for? It was absolutely yeah. absent. Like I said, I couldn't look at the monitor, and Dr. Terry Berry kept pointing, look, look, there is a heartbeat. But uh, it was over a course of three weeks, and my body was still um, undergoing some of the same symptoms of a miscarriage. I continued to um, spot and bleed, so it was truly amazing. Well, we have a clip of your doctor's reaction. Let's take a look. So I walk in the room. They were, there was no um, uh, apprehension on her face. I was the one that had all the apprehension. And uh, we did an ultrasound and uh, there, was, there was a heartbeat. And uh, you know, there's nothing short of a miracle. We love it when we hear doctors use the M word. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm sure he was blessed by that as well. Absolutely. Your doctor was an amazing man who really spoke into the, the hope that you had at that time. Well, your baby is now three years old. She's with us today, appropriately named Grace. Grace, come on in here. Look at you. Wow, there's a miracle. <laughs> now, how did the two of you hope on hope through the weeks that even after you heard that heartbeat, did you have concern about whether this pregnancy was going to really go full term? Oh, absolutely. And for me, um, I relied a lot. I was encouraged by my husband's faith because I remember him developing a stack of three by five cards and he just continued to pray over me and he would put his hand on my stomach and he would quote scripture after scripture, you know, just speaking life into 
the wall. Into the wall, yeah. Mm -hmm. Dennis, tell us about Grace and the addition that she's been to your family. I'm in awe every day. Uh, with my first two children, I was a strict father, you know, to the letter. Here's what we'll do and here's how we'll turn out. Uh, with this one, those rules all went out the window. <laughs> uh, she sleeps with us every night, unlike the other two. Uh, she drinks more chocolate milk than the average child should. <laughs> it, it's absolutely amazing. I think we should change your name to Grace. Yes. <laughs> Well, she's beautiful. Grace, it's so wonderful to have you with us today. And she is just a, a darling, darling child. And Thank I know she's you. been a blessing to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's a blessing to us to hear how God honored the desire of your hearts. Sometimes we forget that the desire of our heart is placed there by God mm -hmm. himself. So sure. Grace really is a fulfillment on more than one level. She's beautiful. Thank, Thank you for you. sharing you your story much. with He's us. It's wonderful. We want all of you to know that we've put together a great little pamphlet for you. It's called Secrets of the Supernatural from the best-selling book, The Secret Kingdom. This is available to any of you who'd like to have it. There's such fascination with the supernatural. God is real. He hears you. He knows you. And he wants to move in your life. So this is available to you. If you'd like a copy, just call our toll-free number. It's 1-800-759-0700. Bless you all. Pat? Thanks, Terry. Little Grace, how sweet. The three-year-old you just met was touched by the supernatural before she was even born. But the child in our next story experienced the same power when she was four years old. One instant, Elise Hester was sitting at a drum set. The next, she was in the middle of a miracle. It's just like an explosion. I mean, that's the only way you can describe it. An SUV speeding at over 100 miles an hour ripped through the concrete wall of this music store. Rick and Teresa Hester had taken their four-year-old daughter there. Little Elise loved to play the drums. I was sitting on the drum set um, in front of her and she was on the drum set behind me. The vehicle plowed over the drum set where Elise was sitting and went through the wall into the mattress store next door. I started to see just maybe two feet in front of me and there was pieces of debris in the floor. And I looked down and all of the drums where we were sitting were taken out. And the first thought that went through my head is, where's Elise? And Teresa hollered Elise's name out twice with no response. And at that point, we just knew she was dead. I looked down at the floor to see if I could see her feet sticking up because pieces of the ceiling were caved in and pieces of the wall. The light was coming in more. You could see pieces of the wall on the floor. I felt afraid. And honestly, it's, it's so strange that in, in just a few seconds you can feel so much emotion, but wow, it's like reliving the whole thing. But I felt like if she's gone, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here either. And I remember that, feeling that I didn't want to be alive if she wasn't alive. But to everyone's surprise and relief, a little figure appeared in the midst of the dust and debris. About probably 15 to 20 seconds later, she came running from the very back of the store and was saying, oh, I'm right here, Mommy, I'm right here. And that was the biggest blessing seeing that child run through there you've ever had in your life. Rick and Teresa started to question little Elise. Her story shocked everyone. And I said, are you okay? And she said, I'm fine. And I said, well, Elise, how did you get off the drums? You were right there on them. And she said, well, Jesus picked me up and moved me, Mom. She said that when he picked her up, he picked her up with one hand, and she said he has really big hands, Mommy, and it, it felt like I was in water. Since then, her story hasn't changed. You told me he did something to your face. What was that? Kissed me. Kissed you where? Can you show, Mom? Right there. How big is Jesus? Big than the whole world. Bigger than the whole world? Mm -hmm. The local paper reported that a medical condition may have been the cause of the driver losing control of the car. Amazingly, he went to the hospital with minor injuries. Store clerk Steve Totten is still amazed at what he saw that day. The last I saw her, she was sitting at the drum set, 
and it happened so fast, we thought she had gotten covered up by the debris. It's just a miracle that nobody got hurt or killed. And to know that she was okay, you know, that made me feel a whole lot better because we really thought she was covered up in all that stuff. Rick and Teresa believe that God truly protected their little girl that rainy summer afternoon. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were in the fiery furnace, and they came out with not even the smell of smoke. And she was so protected that she didn't even have the fear from the accident that we had. It's the most miraculous thing I've ever seen in my life. If I've never seen another miracle as long as I live, I mean, I can actually say I saw one that day. Jesus reached in, took her by the hand, lifted her to the other part of the store. Yeah. <laughs> Can't you? She, she comes walking out of all that debris. Mommy, here I am. But it's always so interesting, too, to hear a child describe yeah. that. I felt like I was in water, you know? Yeah. I mean, just they're, they're very aware of sure. what, the, what their feelings are, what's going on. And Jesus and, had big hands. Yes. Kissed yeah. her on the cheek. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Hey, listen, Amazing. folks, God is alive. Jesus is alive. His power is real. What's in the Bible is real. Okay, let's pray. Get some answers to prayer first. I do. This is Silvana, who lives in Ridge, New York. She hurt her rotator cuff last January. She was in so much pain, it was difficult for her to care for her two young children. Then in February, she saw the story of a woman on this program whose shoulder had been healed after claiming a word of knowledge for herself. And Silvana wondered, how can a word spoken on a taped program have that effect? <laughs> yeah. We wonder that too, Silvana. A few moments later, Pat spoke a word about a shoulder injury that God would restore. Her doubts disappeared. She said, that's for me, that's for me. And she started swinging her arm. Now, if you know anything about rotator cuff oh, injuries, my. you don't do this. No. She started swinging her arm in big circular motions and her pain was entirely gone. God. How can God heal somebody watching on a tape show? I don't have any idea, but it's happened over and over again. John and his wife, Elena of Hayesville, North Carolina, were thrilled when Elena became pregnant. After she had a miscarriage, she was full of fear when she became pregnant a second time. Then John heard me give a word of knowledge about a woman named Elena who was fearful. And God, I said that Jesus was casting out that fear. Terry followed with a word about somebody who was pregnant and fearful. Terry said God was doing a great work. John said, these are for me and my wife. And after a normal pregnancy, Elena gave birth to a healthy baby girl. I did not know Elena. I did not so know she was pregnant. It's interesting, isn't it, that God is concerned about our fear, that he yeah. doesn't want us to be anxious or fretful about things. Jesus said it over and over, he appeared, fear not. You remember this? Yes. Fear not, fear not. I mean, you come into the supernatural, you're scared. You see an angel, some of them swooned. I mean, it was, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an, uh, an otherworldly experience, and it makes us frightened. Well, we're going to pray for you right now, and uh, let's believe God for something wonderful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Terry, I believe God has given you something. Could you, could you share whatever it is that the Lord showed you? There's someone named Martin, and Martin, you've been praying for a long time for something, and you've, you're, you're wondering, does God even hear what I'm saying? But your answer is on its way. Keep praying, keep believing, keep trusting. God is working in a big way on your behalf. There's a knot in somebody's shoulder. I don't know whether you'd hurt a bone somewhere along the way or whether it's a cyst, but it's on your shoulder. If you'd put your hand on it right now in the name of Jesus, that knot's going down. Lord, for others in this, there are a number of people with uh, bronchial problems, yes. uh, breathing problems, and just in the name of Jesus, just cough and, and receive an answer right now. Terry, what Serious else? spinal cord injury. Thank Doctors you. have really given no hope. But even as you've watched these stories today, God is doing a restorative miracle in your body. Something that medicine could not do is being done, and you're going to be able to move again. And we bind the spirit of fear that has come upon people. In the name of Jesus, that spirit of fear is leaving you. You shall praise the Lord. Thank Perfect you, love casts out fear, for fear has torment. The love of God will cast out the fear in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Give us a call and let us hear what uh, the Lord has done for you. And if we can pray for you, the, number, the, the phone's available. Counselors are there on the phone. If they love you, be glad to pray with you. 
Well, if you think miracles were just for people in the Bible, this next story is going to change your mind. For 20 years, Felix was known as the blind beggar in his African village. But today, Felix is a walking miracle. Everyone who saw him couldn't believe their eyes. Felix had been blind for 20 years, and now he could see. Felix remembers when his blindness began. I had very bad headaches that wouldn't go away, and soon everything began to blur, and I went blind. Felix went to local doctors, spending what little money he had, but none could diagnose the cause of his blindness. He even consulted a shaman, but neither the doctor's medicines nor the shaman's charms brought back his sight. When I became blind, my family left me because I could not provide for them. I was helpless. I depended on the community for help. I also started drinking and smoking in order to cope. One day not long ago, Felix was invited to the home of a friend to listen to a program on television. It was an international version of the 700 Club, and something remarkable was about to take place. Although I couldn't see, it felt like the host was talking to me, like he knew me. Then when he began to pray, I felt a sensation like cool water running over my eyes. Then my eyes began to open and I could see. That was when I believed in the awesome power of God. This is Felix's neighbor, Ola Dunny, who knows Felix well and who actually witnessed the miracle. After the prayer on the program, he could see. We were so happy when he received his sight. From that day on, his life changed. In fact, Felix prayed to receive Jesus as his savior, and after 20 years alone, he has remarried and has a new baby girl. He now lives here in this large home with his extended family. I really love CBN programs. I pray that others can experience God through these programs too. You know, your membership in the 700 Club is what makes it possible for us to declare who Jesus is, to pray with people, to lead them in truth all around the world. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month to join the 700 Club. And that's why we ask you today to go to your phone and call and become a part of the family of ministries going out from here. Just call that toll-free number, 1-800-759-0700. Say, I want to join the 700 Club. When you do, we're going to send you life beyond the grave. These are amazing stories of people who died and came back to tell about the experience they had, some going to heaven, yeah. some going to hell. You want to get a hold yeah. of that. Uh, we may have time for a quick question. We uh -huh. do. All right. This is Jim who says, I know Satan is a fallen angel. Are all demons fallen angels? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, he was a, uh, a mighty angel. He was a cherub. Uh, he was walked in the stones of fire. He was uh, actually involved in covering the very holiness of God. Mm -hmm. So he was ahead. But the, the, there are levels of angelic authority. There are principalities and powers, Paul told us. So they're all, they're all ex-angels. They're, 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 they're fallen angels, as far as I can tell, every one of them. He yes. took with him a third of the angels. That's what the Bible says in one instance. So anyhow, phew, the thing of it is, in Jesus, we have victory over yeah. Satan. Well, tomorrow, Cece Wylands joins us live, plus Secrets of the Supernatural continue with the miracle on Highway 6. And we leave you today with these words from Job. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. He is our God. Hallelujah. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Here at CBN, we see amazing things happen when we stand together. That's why we want to say thank you to the thousands of you who recently pledged to join the 700 Club. Your monthly gift makes it possible to bring crucial help to those who need it most. You help heal the sick, feed the hungry, and preach the gospel across America and throughout the world. You've brought health and hope to people in desperate need. And changed their lives forever. This widow is so poor, she had to search for food for her children. Many times, all she could find was ant larvae. When her daughter became ill with a deadly parasite, you sent a free medical clinic that saved her life. You also gave this family a small poultry business so that they can support themselves. Your love ended their despair. So please, watch for this mailing and send in your pledge. 
This year, millions will know the love and saving power of Jesus Christ. And that only happens because you were there.